want to talk to you about my friend Ted. I thought this would be a good place to do that. <laughs> my friend Ted was a, was a really remarkable guy. He was a fantastic artist, uh, one of the best painters I've come across. And, uh, but in addition to that, he spent the last 25 years of his life devoted to the cause of the 12th step of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he uh, reached out to people who were often in their darkest days and offered them a way back to a better life. And uh, he became a legend in AA circles. He really had a gift for seeing the good that remained in somebody when they were at their worst. He was, uh, he was quite a guy. That was one of his favorite songs. That was called Look for the Silver Lining. Ted sang that song to me on January 3rd of this year when he called me and uh, hadn't heard from him in a while. He, we chatted for a bit. He sang that tune. And then um, we said goodbye, and he passed away the next day. And uh, I didn't know he was, he was that close to the end, but he did. And I've, the fact that he reached out to me uh, on his last day on Earth was, will stay with me forever. Ted was my sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. My uh, pre-vernal season of regrowth and rebirth and renewal began in March of uh, 2008 after uh, a long period of, of some real miserable times. And coming uh, into contact with Ted in my darkest days was a real, uh, was a real lifesaver. Now you might wonder how, how did I get to a point where I was in that kind of a position. I grew up in Qualicum Beach. I was a nice middle class boy. I was the valedictorian in my graduating class. All I ever wanted to do was be a great musician. And I, I uh, moved to New York when I was uh, 17. I drank a bit in high school. I maybe smoked a little dope, but nothing serious, nothing, nothing uh, that problematic. When I went to New York, I started studying with a guy who was a musical hero of mine, but he had terrible drug problems. And soon I did too. In fact, I left Qualicum Beach when I was 17, a clear-eyed and, and uh, optimistic uh, young man. And by the time I was 18, I was uh, sticking needles in my arm and, and uh, sort of setting the tone for what would be the pattern in my life for the next 25 years. And, uh, so that's how easy it is to happen. Nobody sets out to be giving a talk like this, I'll tell you that. <laughs> uh, I was always a good musician. I moved to Toronto. I pursued my career in music, and I did really well. I did well, really well. I was at the top of the Canadian music business, which is where they send people to be in the witness protection program. So it's not <laughs> like that was, that was any big deal. But, uh, but but I was doing well. I was making a good living doing something that I enjoyed, and I had profile. I was in the, I was in the paper all the time, and I'm, I was a favorite with CBC radio producers, and uh, soon, soon enough, I, I met the girl of my dreams. We, uh, we moved in. We had kids. We bought a house together and then got married in that order, much to, to the chagrin of my more conservative neighbors who thought we were setting a bad example for their kids. But um, I, I might be... I might have been what you might call a high-functioning drug addict, although I think that was a term invented by drug addicts to feel better about themselves. <laughs> but I don't think I don't think you're I think you're kidding yourself if you think you're actually functioning at a high level. You might be, as our previous speaker suggested, you might be surviving, but you're not thriving, and uh, and uh, that was me. I was. I had the appearance of. Uh, I guess I had I had extra capacity because I could still. I still could work, I still had a family, and believe me, those were, the, those were my priorities. Those came first. Um, but while this was going on, I was just, I was really uh, drinking up a storm and using a lot of drugs. I really preferred the uh, pain relieving drugs like uh, the opium family, heroin and Percodan and morphine. So it was nothing for me to, to chase down a handful of Percocets with a Mickey of vodka before I went to work. You know, I was in the probably the only profession in the world where that sort of thing is actually kind of encouraged. <laughs> in, in some ways, people, a lot of musicians had legendary tolerance for being able to do stuff like that, and, and I, uh, I fell into that, that trap. 
um, you know, because I was putting my, my career and my family first, I was, I'd be going on and off the drugs and on and off the booze. And I think I had more withdrawals than a lot of bank machines by the time I was 30 years old. I, but I knew there was something wrong. I knew that I had to find, find some help. But every time I tried to quit, the pain came back. And when, you, when you've been medicating yourself to that extent and you stop, it's like tearing bandages off of open wounds that are all over your body. And if you don't have something to replace that with, you're either going to stay in pain or you're going to go back to what you were doing in the first place. And that was what happened to me. So I would either just go back to what I was doing or I would go into a deep depression. And uh, I remember being at a funeral for a friend who had committed suicide. And somebody said to me, I could never understand how somebody could get into that frame of mind to do that. And I remember thinking to myself, I know. I know exactly what he was thinking. That's, that's how I feel, too, a lot of the time. And uh, I'd, seen, I'd seen depression. My father had been depressed. I, I know now, think, knowing what I know now, I'd seen him go, go through that same thing. I knew I had to get help. I reached out to my family doctor. She knew me. The best help you're going to get for a situation like this from people that know you the best because they have a reference point. She knew me. She, we, we thought maybe I had bipolar disorder. It seemed to fit. So I started taking medication for that. It seemed to be working. Then I went to a psychiatrist who didn't know me. He took me off the bipolar medication and gave me another medication, which, in effect, made me go completely insane. Um, I'm not saying it was his fault. I'm just saying that in the course of a 40-minute appointment with somebody you don't know, it's really hard to get a good read on what their mental situation is really like. I started, we had, I had a lot of deaths in my life at that time. My father died, many close friends. I was on and off the booze, on and off these different medications. I was up and down like a yo-yo. Pretty soon, I started going into what is called a bipolar one manic psychosis, which is about as much fun as it sounds. <laughs> if you've ever, it actually starts off being really fun, way too much fun, which is part of the problem. You feel so great, you can't imagine there's anything wrong with you. It'd be like that movie, The Beautiful Mind, without the math skills. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how I felt. I was, I was on top of the world. This was the real me, finally. I was going to set the world on fire. I was seeing mystery cues in all aspects of life, different coincidences. I thought I was on a secret mission to do all sorts of things. I started emailing Harvard University, explaining to them how they could better structure their operating model. <laughs> I, I, uh, near the end, I was teaching at York University for 10 years up until that point. Near the end, I went to school one day and I bought a television from one of my students. I took it into my classroom and made all my, my students take turns destroying the television because I thought that the TV was the source of all evil in our society, which just proves that even if you're crazy, you still have one foot in reality. <laughs> but needless to say, I mean, it's probably no surprise that after my sick benefits ended, my contract wasn't renewed at York. I, the damage had been done there. Um, anyways, it got worse and worse. Finally, on my wife's birthday, January 19th, 2001, I hired a brass band to play at her yoga studio while the class was going on. <laughs> I took all the guys in the band to the liquor store and bought them each a bottle of $200 bottle, $200 bottle of wine. I went and signed closing papers on a real estate deal. I went home. I was in conflict with everybody at this point, And by the mid-afternoon, I knew that there was something seriously wrong and I checked myself into the psychiatric emergency ward at what's called CAMH, Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto. And now I was like the, like the characters from The Wizard of Oz. I had a diagnosis. I had my official medallion that said I was nuts. And, and, uh, and I was bipolar, and I was really, really sick. I went from Russell Crowe at his peak to Jack Nicholson just before he got smothered with the pillow. I was lying in bed drooling and unable to communicate, unable to take care of myself. In fact, the only thing that was still working was my musical skills. I was like, I don't know if you ever uh, go fishing and catch a rockfish. You can smash it on the head. 
and uh, three hours later you take it out of the boat and it's still twitching. And that was my, those were my music skills. I could still, I could still do music and, uh, and I felt like I had to keep working but for me my time in Toronto was done. I felt like damaged goods and I really needed to leave the city. So we moved back to the island and I got some few psychiatric appointments. I couldn't get any ongoing therapy. I got some different drugs. I kept drinking. I was on the road a lot. I was killing lots of bottles of scotch in my room after, after concerts. I was really in my darkest days. And then I woke up one morning and I saw what was happening in my life and I decided that that was the day I was going to change. That was March 16, 2008. And that's when I got Ted in my life and the AA program and a brilliant psychologist who I started seeing. I had to see her on my own nickel because there's no, um, it wasn't available as a, as a you know, medical health plan paid for service, but I needed to make that investment in myself. I tried actually anything and everything I could think of to get better because I thought my life was on the line. Uh, throughout all of this, and now we're going on 22 years together, my wife, Teresa, has been incredible. She's been seen me at my worst. She's challenged me to be my best. Everybody should be so lucky to have someone like, someone like her in their lives. She saved my life many times. Of course, now apparently I owe her. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I started to heal. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight, but it happens a bit by bit. You go for the small victories. It's the little things, like after 25 years, finally I could be the second driver on the rental van contract on tour with the band because I would be sober all day long. So uh, I did some of my best music work. I really started to feel connected. I really started to thrive and not just survive. I started examining my motivations for doing things and finding my inspiration. And I realized as much as I loved music that maybe this wasn't what I was meant to do for my whole life. And I recently applied to law school and I'm hoping to become a social activist and environmental lawyer and really get involved with helping people and helping the planet and just helping as much as I can because I think that's where my mission really is. It's a good story, it ends well. It's not over yet, I'm still sick. Two weeks ago I almost canceled coming here. I was really depressed. I was afraid to come. I was in bed for a couple of days that just, and, and, I, and I fought it off. I said, I'm, well, I'm afraid of Shannon for one thing. So, um, <laughs> but, but uh, so glad that I came. Anyways, that's my story, but how does that translate into, into uh, our larger society? I mean, what do we hear about the, uh, about the mentally ill and the, and the people that are addicted? We see them on the streets of our cities. We read about them in the media. It's not good stories usually. It wasn't until I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder that I started noticing just how many people with bipolar disorder get shot by the police in an average year. It's a tragedy. It's, people are misunderstood and, and it's not a good story. But it could be. It could be a better story. This is a, uh, a, a solution. This is a problem that, that um, it's not about them, it's about us, it's about all of us. Everybody's involved in this story. There might be 20% of people that have a mental illness at some point in their life, but for every one of those, there's all the people that are around them being affected. And there's all different kinds of mental illnesses. There's ones that are like mine, which are considered to be chronic but treatable. There's ones that might come and go, there's ones that might just come once. It could be something like an eating disorder or an obsessive compulsive or, or an anxiety disorder. There's all different kinds, but some way or another, it's going to affect all of us, and we have to start thinking about it in those terms. Um, I've also heard the figure $3.5 billion missing from our economy because of mental health. Well, this is not an issue about the economy. This is not about putting people back to work in the widget factory. This is about the human capital that we need to invest in to get people back working, get them back at their best, healing the social fabric, regaining our emotional equilibrium. These are the things that we need to invest in. This is not an economic issue. I mean, having good employment is a, is a, is, is a big part of recovering, but that's not, it's not a money thing. It's a human being thing. It doesn't have to be a big overarching funding announcement or policy. It could be just a small thing. 
I said hi to a, to a, a homeless guy on the street in Toronto the other day. I have a lot in common. We get talking, you know, what meds are you on, and which hospital did you go to, and how about that nurse, and you know, this sort of thing. But it's, I'm always shocked at how much I have in common with, with people on the street. And, uh, and he said, you know what makes a difference? Somebody stopping to talk to me rather than looking down at me because of where I am. This guy worked in the construction business his whole life, and he was down. He is sunk into depression because he felt guilty because his son had died and he didn't feel like he had done enough to help him. And, and that was it for him. And I said, you can get better, my friend. And we talked. So to my friend JC on the street of Toronto, you get better, my friend. I'm pulling for you. I know lots of people that are in various phases of mental health illnesses and recoveries. I have a friend uh, who's working on his second PhD. He has, he has a real OCD issue. And he just needs somebody to talk to him once in a while. But, He's doing too well to be a part of the official mental health system. I have a friend who had a brain injury back in 1979. He's been on disability ever since. He doesn't need to be on disability. He needs somebody to talk to. My friend Mike, who was struggling with cocaine addiction, he was at, had his wit's end. And I knew that. And I called him up and I said, Mike, get to a meeting. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just get to a meeting today. We'll talk about tomorrow, tomorrow. Three years later, he's sober. And I hear from him all the time about how grateful he was for that one phone call. It's, this is a progressive illness. We need to get involved early in the problem. We can't be afraid that we don't know what to do. We don't know exactly what to do. We can't sacrifice any of these lives on the altar of indifference or indecision. Who knows who we might be missing out on? We might be missing the next Julie Payette. It could be the next David Suzuki, the next Justin B. OK, <laughs> Julie Payette and David Suzuki anyways. You know, no more. It's no more morally defensible to deny help to somebody struggling with a mental illness than it would be to not help somebody who was drowning. You might not be the strongest swimmer, but you can do something. You can throw them something. You can tell them. Just hang on. Somebody else is coming soon that, that, that can help you. You can do something. You know, the medical system is a big part of this. Like the education system, the medical system is full of people who care about what they do. They're talented. They're passionate. But the diversity of the clientele and the, and the limitations of budgets you, just like you can't expect your children to get all of their education at school, you can't expect somebody to get all of their help through the medical system. They need all of us. They need the entire community to stand up and be there for them. So, I mean, if, you're, if you think you need help, reach out for help. Go to a meeting. Call the mental health hotline. Call me if you have to, but only as a last resort. <laughs> if you know somebody that's suffering, reach out to help them. They might not be at their best. It might be uncomfortable. It might be hard. But help them, hold them, love them, heal them. See the good in everyone. Look for the silver lining. Thank you.